the topic today is really all about the party coming back in um, and uh, the role of the CCP uh, in this process. Um, you know, you'll, you'll read this stuff and I'll sort of repeat it, which is one of the problems with PPTs, but nonetheless, we'll go this way. You know, basically one of the advantages that's been going on is this reverse brain drain. For, I mean, Stan and I wrote this book about the brain drain and most developing societies have suffered from a loss of talent from the, the developing world basically to the advanced world and that's been pretty universal. But China has been working very hard and is one of the study, one of the countries that people now look at for this brain gain or reverse brain drain because clearly there is a significant flow going back. Now, uh, you could put it forward as a hypothesis to what extent is it the government versus the economy. I could stand here and give you a talk and say it's the economy that's brought people back. Uh, I've written about that, but that's not the talk today. The talk today is the other side, uh, uh, the other hypothesis or the other perspective, which is really the role of the state and particularly the role of the Communist Party. And I came to realize this more and more as I started to, I was on a sabbatical uh, from Hong Kong and I got a hold of a manuscript or a, a, a study done by a, a friend of mine in the Ministry of Education and uh, all of a sudden I started to realize the depth of the, this program called the Thousand Talents Program, which the Chinese Communist Party began to run in late 2008. And taking that and then going backwards, I started to look more and more at the role of the CCP in this whole effort and you can track it back to about 2001, about 2002, 201, 202. So they've been actually, the party's been at it for a long time. Um, and so what I thought was important is to see to what role the state actually has played and has it been successful? You know, and that's a really key question. Um, now, uh, uh, the, so the question really becomes what can governments do, right, as compared to individuals? We know the labor, the individuals, families, all these variables are important. I'm not going to talk about sort of the individual evaluation or the individual rationale so much. This is really more about the state's job uh, to get people to come back. And so some of the things that the states can do, one of the things is it can lower the transaction costs. It can make it easier for people to return. China is a complex society, administratively, bureaucratically, all very difficult. If the state wants people to come back, it's got to make it easier. So things like dual passports, long-term residence cards, these are things that uh, many states do. Um, uh, China, Hong Kong, uh, the China itself, uh, has created high tech zones with tax breaks, discount floor space, uh, help people get into the marketplace because people who return have been out of the country for a long time often don't know how to manage, navigate the internal market situation. They can also play a very important role in enhancing the scientific climate and scientific culture and as I will argue in, uh, in this case of China in really creating a, a, an, an intellectual environment, a psychological a, a space, an environment where returnees can be received and welcome as compared to confronting a bias that says you've been overseas, you've been away, uh, you don't know China, you're taking advantage of our situation here domestically and we don't really want you back. Now these are just some of the people who have write, written stuff about uh, the general situation of what states can do uh, so that they can enabling environment in the country of origin, the establishment of the rule of law, property rights, open and transparent government, lack of corruption, other things, dual citizenship which is a big issue in China which they won't solve but they do give long-term residence permits. Um, if you have uh, a, f a foreign citizenship. And a long time ago, an, uh, a, a very famous person who studied migration talked about the state overcoming a bias against returnees. So even back in the, I may have been studying the Italian labor, you know, mar laborers coming back to Italy after working overseas, but already he, he recognized the importance of bias, which is one of the components that I work into my own perspective. Now, for the first 25 years of the reform, the, uh, the opening and reform really beginning around 79, 80, so till about the mid uh, 2000s, uh, there was success. It wasn't, you know, we, you can look at it. There, there were serious successes, 
the state was, in, the party was involved only sporadically, um, and the key work was really managed by the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Personnel, Ministry of Science, and by the Ch Chinese Academy of Sciences. So it was the government rather than the party. And the government in China is different than the party in terms of pressures, in terms of the environment that it can create, its ability to mobilize people and make people feel pressured that they have to respond. And so CAS, which is the Chinese Academy of Sciences, had its 100 Talents program, right, which awarded 2 million renminbi, which is a lot of money, to someone who could get an award. And 20% of that could be used for salary which is a big amount of money. If you're a Chinese uh, uh, thinking about going back to China, you can get equipment, labs, um, and you can see what they were rewarded. And by 2004, they had brought back 899 full-time scientists who were working in the Chinese Academy of Sciences. In the education sector, just in the university, the Ministry of Education with Li ka the man who owns Hong Kong, um, he owns half of Hong Kong, sorry, everything in Hong Kong. It's, either one company and then the other half is Li ka -shing. At one point, just to add to it, at the peak of the dot-com boom, he and his son owned 35% of the equity in the Hong Kong stock market. Mm. Right? Interesting number. Um, by 2004, the, his support with the Ministry of Education, they had brought back 537 professors as Changjiang scholars to go into universities. And then the Natural Science Foundation had another program which had brought back by 2004 1,176 uh, uh, people, uh, scientists and research. So that's not bad. But I mean, when you're talking about, you know, first of all, are these, are all the, are these people earth-shattering, you know, unbelievably talented people? Well, the majority of people who actually went back to CAS, yeah, the majority of people who went back to CAS were actually postdocs. Uh, the vast majority were postdocs. They had never run a lab before. They had never been a senior researcher before. So back around 2005, 2006, Rao Yi, uh, a guy who was teaching then at Northwestern, said that there are about a thousand really talented mainland Chinese living in the United States, running key institutes, running key laboratories. And those are the people that, weren't, that aren't in this group of people who returned. The cities within China, when you study China, you can't just look nationally, you have to look at the local level. Municipalities have a great deal of autonomy uh, or a great deal of energy effort. They compete with each other. They try and get resources, try and get people. So they were all competing, offering different kinds of special incentives to try and get people to come back. Um, the Zhang era, I actually am, a, before this last, before six months ago, I was a big fan of Jiang Zemin's. I'm not such a big fan now, but I always thought that Jiang Zemin was under, under recognized for a lot of the things and creativeness that he did. And, and in this policy, he was also quite, quite open-minded. And he accepted the fact that rather than trying to stop Chinese from going out, he basically said these people, because he really has a global vision, and he said these people are global talent. And we want these people to be talented, let them go out, let them learn, let them learn the best from the West, and then give a, create an environment for them to come back. That's how China will grow, not by constraining them from going out uh, in the first place. So that was really quite forward-looking. And Zhu Rongji, similarly, henceforth China would change the emphasis um, uh, from attracting foreign capital to attracting human talent and technology. This is clear China has, become, has come to recognize the importance of talent. So, success and problems, a mixed outcome, right? Um, uh, I did a, a, a research many years ago on the first group of Chinese to go out, 79, 80, 81, and that's an understudied, or not understudied, but a very interesting group. They were the, they, most of them came to the United States, and many of them studied technologies that they hadn't seen in 15 years, because universities and labs were you know, China had been cl cut off from the world since 1966, right? Or even earlier from the world, let's say even the late 1950s, early 1960s. These guys came to the United States and other parts of the world, Western world, and found these amazing technologies that they hadn't had. And then they go back to China right at the time that the World Bank is giving China $800 million in an education loan. 
And so all these people went out and bought that equipment that they'd been working on in the U.S. And China made a great leap forward in the 1980s in science and technology, right? So that's the story there. Um, but really the flow stops, the flow stops around 87 uh, and then really comes to a complete halt of returnees um, in 89. And I love this because if you ever want to think about uh, sort of looking at a table that, or an event that really cre creates, clearly creates a changing flow of some kind of uh, a people movement, here's 1989 and here's mainlanders versus Taiwanese and Indians um, getting awarded doctoral degrees in science and engineering, right? Uh, just the jump, right? It should be from 1980, I don't know why it says 98 to 202. Um, I'll have to check that, correct that, but that's just, you can see here's Tiananmen, right? On some maps, I've, and sometimes I put this table, it says here, Tiananmen, right? Awarded in the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah. Basically, they stay. Yeah. They don't go back. Right? And creates what I call you know, an, an immediate diaspora, which immediately creates the opportunity or the need for trying to bring people back because here's a cohort of people who have stayed abroad and have become quite well educated. And if you want to get ahead, you got to get these people to come back. These are other tables. This is another table. Similarly, uh, this is number of percent of Asian science and uh, engineering doctoral recipients with firm plans to stay in the United States between 1988 and 96. And you can see that uh, percent with firm plans to stay, uh, basically the Indians and the Chinese are at the top. Uh, the, in the Chinese stay with postdocs. Uh, Indians were much more likely to get a job. So Chinese again here with postdocs, not getting jobs, um, but still planning to stay, right? Now here's the, the basically the point I made before uh, about the Chinese Academy of Sciences, that they were all predominantly postdoctoral fellows with no experience of running a lab. And immediately they got full professorship, running a lab, leading a team, assistance from uh, domestic PhDs, uh, people who had gotten their PhD in China, and then would come and work with them or as their assistants, which will create red eye disease, right? A, a, a serious jealousy problem, and I can talk about that at another time uh, or later on. Uh, but I had an interview once in the Northeast around 2004, and one of the directors of a Cass Institute said he could not get the top 20% of mainland scientists who were abroad. So there really is this view, there really was this view all along that we weren't getting the best. China couldn't get the best to come back. Part of it was work climate. Um, the, the most common phrase that we hear, well, here, returnees complain of time wasted on cultivating personal relations. Um, as the Chinese always say, renji guanxi tai fu zha, right? Uh, human relations are just too complicated, right? Interpersonal relations, too complicated. Uh, you have to make all kinds of contacts to get your grants and, and all this kind of stuff, and petty jealousies and knives in your back and stuff like that. Entrepreneurs have always been easier to bring back because it's the marketplace and they work on their own. There are problems with entrepreneur, for entrepreneurs coming back to China, but overall you're not sitting underneath the director of a research institute, right? You pick your own team in your company. You're not being forced to work with uh, people uh, who, who are not of your own choosing who may be angry about the opportunity, extra advantages that you've got from coming back. So we'll see this as well with the Thousand Talents program, that the entrepreneurs are much more responsive um, to it than uh, scientists and university professors. But there's been a jump uh, since 1999, a big jump following 2007, right? Uh, and, but let me just show you the table. So here, these are number of returnees <coughs> here. And so you can see the numbers of returnees are going back the number of returnees uh, has gone up significantly, but it's also a reflection of the fact that more and more people are going out. And the numbers going out uh, have shot through the roof. Uh, 2010 or 2011 were up to 380,000 or something. So this is cut off as the number continues to rise dramatically. Uh, the, the thing with most of these people 
are that they're not PhDs. Most of them are MAs and MBAs. I've gone out for one year, two years. Uh, they're not the world-class scientists that the party wants to make China big and strong, right? And, and that it really wants to attract. But it makes the numbers sound good. So if the, you know, it's good for newspaper stories, right? Number of returnees way up, right? Um, so, uh, so I decided to go and look at really what, how the party had been involved in this. And what I can track back is the sort of the origins of all this is May 2002, the CCP and the State Council have a 205 outline for building the ranks of nationwide talent, Ren Sai Cheng Wo Jiang Lue, right? And that they're going to do this through human talent. So Zhu Rongji said it in 201, they're already starting to do it in 202. Uh, Dennis Simon and Tsong Cao say that this is the first CCP national level meeting to discuss talent. And, and it calls for complete trust and determine concrete methods for selecting highly talented returners to take up leadership positions. Well, so there's that value. But where the, trend, where the shift really occurs is that the party had always said that it was responsible for managing talent, right? That the party manages talent. Well, that's section 2002, but very soon after that, they decided to shift to the idea that the party should manage, um, sorry, the party had always managed officials. Now it was switching to make the argument that the party should manage talent. And that's really the critical transition. Hu Jintao talked about it. And they set up an organization to manage this, a small leadership group to coordinate the work on talent. And this is under the party. So the party already was talking about taking its job in, in managing talent. And local governments were setting up their own branch, their sort of bureaus on managing talent. Um, now, unfortunately, the organization department of the Communist Party, which is responsible for personnel, and Zheng Qinghong back here, who I mentioned at that point, was the head of the organization department, right? Um, they really were not able to transform the units where people worked. And most of us who work on this topic really feel that the best aren't going to return until somehow the internal environment, what Sarasa called the bias, the, the internal environment uh, within these units change, people aren't necessarily, aren't, aren't going to come back. And I still stand by that. Um, so here, a web-based survey that I found in 2004, 3,000 respondents, the most important force holding people back from returning was the complicated nature of human relations in Chinese society, Renji Guan Shi Tai Fu Zha, right? Uh, investors felt the legal system needed an improvement. I did a survey in 2002 with my friend Chen Changui, a good friend of Stan's, um, and what we found was that people wanted a systematic reform of China's policies on human talent. Um, uh, and a lot of this would be improving the climate for returnees. And so that really, by 2006, 2007, people are starting to get it. They understand this to a certain extent. Now, I found it very interesting as I looked at the document, this book that my friend gave me, that even before the party came out with its program, the Ministry of Education came out with a program that seemed to be one year ahead of the ministry, of, of the organization department. And I never asked the organization department, did you guys steal the program? But it's possible that they did. But uh, Jiang Zemin's girlfriend, Chen Zhe Li, um, she, she was responsible for education. And she came out in March 2007, uh, well before the organization department does that. She said, she admitted that the universities did not have enough talent to make China a creative society and that it needed new ways of thinking and new methods to bring people back. And it needed more mature world-class professors, right? Um, these are all the kinds of things that you're going to hear in 2009 when you look at the parties program. And I was struck by the fact that she was already saying them in 2007. Now again, the argument that people weren't necessarily coming back here again, you, you know, the U.S. government does a great job of collecting this data, in, at least in the U.S. And here by 20s, these are people in 20s who got their PhDs 
in uh, science and engineering in 2002 who were still in the U.S. in 2007. So this is five years post-PhD. What countries have people who are still here? Well, Clayton didn't say I'm Canadian, um, but we, we, we don't do so well either in terms of or we, we move a lot, right? Also from Canada. Um, uh, and, but the worst is China and then India. Those are the two countries that seem to be most likely to not have people go back after they get their degrees. Uh, there's your Thailand for you. All right. So October 2007, Li Yanchao becomes the member of the Central Committee, uh, member of the Politburo, uh, and becomes the head of the organization department and the head of the leadership small group. And I was able through, again, this document to trace many of his speeches. And I'm a big fan of Li Yanchao. I have to tell you, if a guy, if we need somebody to run China, who's, you know, he, he would be a really interesting person to do it. And he talks about talent being the core of a nation's creativity. I mean, these are standard, so let's get stronger, strategic resource, strategic investment. Um, but what I like is he calls for creating a welcoming environment based on three kinds of quan, quan song, quan rong, and quan ho, basically relaxed, tolerant, and lenient environment. So, and within units, he wants to see this happen as well because he knows that people aren't going to come, right? He tells Chinese executives to appeal to the hearts of returnees, including the love of country, but the love of careers and, and a Maslov, what's his name, Maslov, uh, uh, sense of sort of self-esteem, recognize that, you know, he knows what the literature is saying in psychology. He, he seems to know what the literature is saying and what makes for a good city that, uh, you know, it sound of, he sounds like Florida, the, you know, the guy who writes about how do you get a good city going. I mean, he seems to have learned a lot of this stuff. And, and he wants firms that can make China into an innovative nation. And his favorite, his favorite laboratory in China is the National Institute of Biological Science, uh, which has em employed world-class Western standards for hiring and promotion. And, and when you talk about this in the mainland, people who know him well or know the situation well, this institute stands out. So I'm hoping to go uh, and visit them. So in December, the small group uh, outlines the new program called the Thousand Talents Program, which the idea being that China is going to bring back 2,000 highly talented people over five to ten years. And this is really the party's program to get those thousand people in the United States who won't come back, and other countries as well. There's some in Canada, there's some in Europe, but the heart of it, the heart of it is really, which is why it's, I was thinking U.S.-China Institute, you know, why? Well, this really is targeted by and large at the United States. Um, now, it emphasizes again that human talents is the most important, absolute, innovative, right? It got all the big words, you know, people who can make breakthroughs in key technologies, serve as science and technological leaders, bring forward newly emerging fields. And under this program, each locality in China was to sit down, every city in China was to sit down and say, where are we short? So we've got a national level program and a municipal level program. And every city was supposed to come up with a list of where are we short in terms of human talent um, and then come up with a list of jobs and potentially people or positions that they would need to recruit. And that was then their job to go out and try and recruit this. So um, people, uh, Li and Chao had people go around, Wang Hui Yao, my friend who I did this paper with, he, in fact, went around nationwide uh, talking about Talent War. He wrote a book called Talent War, and he was part of this program to mobilize local cities to think about who do they need, what do they need, what talent do they need, and, and how to go out and get it. And so cities, you know, this isn't just national level, right? Cities had to volunteer commitments uh, and say how many people they would go out and bring back. Right? Beijing announced 500 people. I interviewed one of the, the office running this program uh, for Beijing, and they could do 500 because they have Zhongguansun, right? They have the Beida Tsinghua high tech zone, uh, and so it's not, it wasn't so difficult for them to say we can get 500. But I mean, is Jinan going to be able to get 150 world class? 
you know, scientists. But these are voluntary numbers, right? But then remember the Great Leap Forward, everybody volunteered how much grain they would turn over. Um, this was all to happen within three to five years. The people in Guangzhou told me that it would be very difficult to do it, though I just had lunch with a table of, of, of biz entrepreneurs uh, who came back under this program. I had lunch with them in Guangzhou. So city, provincial governments, they set out, they traveled all around, and here's where they were going, you know, different cities, New York, Toronto, Singapore. Um, and the package was very competitive, and uh, so this is both national and local level. Now, the original content of the program was, and this is where the program has run into its biggest problem, is the original content was to be six months Everybody in the initial stage of this program, it was to be full-time commitment. That's what the program wanted. It didn't want any of these two months part-time because they'd already learned from the Chinese Academy of Sciences that people who come for, for two months take the money and run. Uh, don't make very serious contributions. They'd already had that experience. There's an article in Science Magazine um, in the, the, which criticized that. And so they wanted experts and scholars with, a, you know, with titles on a par with professors in prestigious foreign universities and scientific research institutes, right? Senior technology, entrepreneurs who had pr pri pri proprietary intellectual property rights. So they're aware of the problems of intellectual property rights. Uh, and they don't want people who are going to steal the technology and come back and say it's their own, right? Core technologies, all this kind of stuff, must own your IPR, must own your patent. Right? They must be internationally advanced, can fill the domestic gap in this regard, have market potential, and can be put into industrialized production. So these are all, this was the requirement that they wanted. They had age, I'm sorry, I mentioned, right, foreign PhDs under 55. Uh, that's very important. They have much, some, at least in terms of entrepreneurs, they had to have started their own business or been middle-level managers for a long time. So they're really aware of, they don't want the, the end of the spectrum. They want, they want the cutting edge leaders, and you can see all this. And employers must find jobs for spouses, schools for children. They can go any city they want. This is really a, a good program, right? Um, in fact, the city of Wuxi, uh, which has already brought back 1,500 people, uh, will become anybody's business partner. And they'll put up 50% of the capital to start your company. So if any of you want to go start a company in China, Wuxi is the place to go, right? And Li, Wuxi is under Jiangsu province, and it was Li Yuanchao who was involved in getting that program going. Uh, actually, the first time I met him was at a conference in Wuxi. So um, money-wise, it's not that great. You get a one million renminbi subsidy, but all this good stuff, housing, food, tax-free, you can buy a second house. Uh, new salaries have to be reasonable in light of the previous salary overseas. Uh, so, and they set up a team to manage all this kind of stuff and make sure that it all worked. Now, one of the things that, because it's the party, and uh, since I am a political scientist, um, uh, you can, it was important to me to, I, I would sort of press people and say, well, the fact that the party was running it rather than the government, did that make it different? And, um, one of my friends in Guangzhou said, absolutely, I'll show you the quote in a minute, but th first of all, it used to be the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Services, which had, run the pro which had been the head of the, the leadership small group, and it was taken over by the organization department. So the head of the leadership small group is now, as of, because of this program, 2008, Li Yuan Chao takes over, so it's now the, the party that's running this leadership small group, and in cities all over China, these small leadership small groups are run now by the, the, the head of the organization department and the municipal department. So now if you're a government official, you go into the office or you go in for a meeting, the guy running the meeting is now the head of the organization department, the personnel department of the Communist Party who can hire and fire and carries a lot of weight. So he's now running that. Now there was little formal change. The only place that I saw formal change was uh, all, the Ministry of Education uh, had service centers for scholarly exchange. Some of them were joint, I mean they were joint with the Ministry of Human Resources and that office in Beijing was taken over by the organization department. So it was moved from being a government office to a party organization directly. So they weren't just reporting to a party official now, but the organization itself was moved 
under the Communist Party, uh, uh, under the Ministry of Education, uh, and that that I met these guys, and they were they're pretty cool. I mean, if you go on my website, there's a picture of me with them. Um, uh, and some of them had been at long involved academics or researchers long involved in returnees who were now engaged in this program. But the informal, but my argument would be the informal authority has really shifted. Um, as I said, they no longer report to the, to, uh, uh, oh, it says here, under the MRS and city government, they now report right to the local leadership small group, which is directly under the municipal party committee. So they're reporting directly to the party now. The meetings are now run by the local CCP committee and the organization bureau, right? Um, and so that puts people under a different kind of situation. Uh, the mobilization that occurred, uh, local bureaucrats felt much more pressures. Now, my friend, one of my friends in Guangzhou assured me that they're soft quotas which means if you don't meet it, you're not going to lose your job. It's not like quotas. It's not like the party giving you a quota of finding 5% bad guys during the anti-rightist campaign where then you have to go out and, you know, and sort of kill 7% of the people working in your factory because you, know, you have to meet your quota. Right? This is a soft quota and it won't affect careers. But as my friend said, the policy is now under the CCP, so of course the pressure is greater. Right? Um, heightened expectations, uh, that, uh, particularly on the units that use these people, universities and high tech parks, they feel now really that they have to meet this. Uh, and the based indicator of the pressure is that they were supposed to get 2,000 people back within 10 years. The program started in 88, it's 2013, and they're already at 3,000 people. So they've overfulfilled their quota. Right? Which is, you know, good party, good party behavior, right? And the pressures. So I interviewed some people at a major university in North China and their school, the dean, feels under pressure. But there's also incredible rewards to this program. And this got my provost in Hong Kong a little bit annoyed, right? Uh, I believe it is that I put it down here. You get or is it the next one? Yeah, look at this. If a school can get a national level guy, not a local thousand talents, but a national level, a person who passes the criteria, meets the board, There's, there are evaluation boards that decide whether or not you can get the, you know, recognized as a thousand talents person. If you pass that board, you will get 12, your school will get 12 million renminbi. That's a lot of money. That's a big incentive um, for a university to go out and try and recruit as many thousand talents people as they can. That's a lot of money. And that money can get shared. Some of it goes to the returnee himself, but the dean can also, at least in this university, redistribute to some of that money to other faculty. So if the school can bring in a big chunk of change, it can share that money. Um, uh, colleges with locally approved full-time thousand talents re received eight million renminbi, which they can keep. Now this really needs to be though the people who stay for six months or longer. You don't get much if you get short-term people. So the universities, uh, the institutes have a strong incentive to try and get people to come back full-time which is, you know, something that China, this is really critical to this. Um, let me see, was there anything else on this before I jumped? Um, university faculty were, you know, mobilized to call their friends who they knew overseas and try and encourage them to come back. Uh, one of these people said, I have no pressure, but my dean does, right? The, and the government, the party, wants to see this happen and, and I think, unfortunately, tried to do it ha too fast. That's partly my view. Um, Okay, now, there are some advantages. Uh, I did some interviews in Xi'an with the office, an office at a university that was responsible for recruiting, and TTP, which I thought is an interesting term for it because I made that up, Thousand Talents Program. Um, it's very important for Western China because it brings about some serious changes. It's, and she, this person said, the government here are all leftists. They are not willing to change things. But if, if before, if a wife wanted to live here, so you get a returnee, but as a U.S. citizen, she had to go back to the U.S. yearly to renew her China visa, we could not get her long-term residence, but now the city government has agreed to give people a green card or a long-term residence permit. We didn't have it here. Shanghai did, but now we do. 
So the Thousand Talents program, and one of the things I'm interested in is sort of how these kinds of externally oriented programs have domestic influence, right, influence China internally. This is one of the, I got a lot of information in Xi'an on how the university itself internally is changing because of this program, which is quite positive. Um, but here, you know, the program really uh, getting people mobilized. But it's a very secret program in some ways. And why is there secrecy? Uh, the, originally, there was a list of 360 returnees under the threat program posted on the web. And then, uh, no, but, other, but universities don't want to talk about this. Now, there's various reasons why they don't want to talk about it. I think one is it's a major party organized effort to take to, to sort of bring people back from overseas. Governments do it, you know, in some way. My, 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 the Canadian government has the um, Canada Research Chairs, where they went out and gave university positions to people all across Canada. This is actually becoming more popular all around the world. Other countries are doing this kind of thing. But I think, one, the party feels uncomfortable, partly because it's the party that's doing this rather than the government. Someone said to me that they think that some of the mainland professors would feel uncomfortable because it's the party that's coming to talk to them rather than the government that's coming to talk to them. Um, one thing that I think is silly, uh, and, and I think it's, a, it's unfortunate, is some uh, professors, mainland professors, are trying to grab two salaries. And they're asking the universities that they're coming to back in China not to let it be known that they've got this position. If you go on the websites of many universities in China, you, they won't list their Thousand Talents recipients. And so there's, there's this famous case of Wang Xiaodong, who was keeping his job at Ohio State and had become the dean of a new school college of pharmacy at Nankai. Um, and, and in fact, to respond to this, my own provost really wants this open, upfront, tell us about it, and we'll make a deal. We'll talk to the university that you're, you're talking to, and we'll make some kind of open contract, and we'll have this happen. And we've already done that for three faculty members who are part-time Thousand Talents people now back in China, and, and a deal's been struck, so that's okay. Right? So here, HKUS2 has set up formal, that's my school, with Zhongshan University for part-time employees. So that's okay. But people don't want their names posted, right? Um, now, in terms of measuring success, uh, he, here's a comparison of four programs. And one indicator here of success uh, is that the percent with foreign PhDs, the Thousand Talents program has done much better. So it's clearly had significant success. Right, uh, done better than the 100 Talents program or uh, other, other programs. Um, now, other measures of success would be, you know, I, at this point when I put this paper together, I figured this was still going to be a number of years before the numbers were going to be, well, it's still hard. It'll take a couple of years to see whether these people have big impact and how many of these people are really sort of world-class guys. These two guys, Shuri Gong and Rao Yi, are world-class guys. Uh, sure, Yi Gong gave up a Hughes Fellowship to go back to China. Hughes Fellowship is a major scientific uh, uh, fellowship in the United States. He was teaching at Princeton. He gave it up. Uh, Rowie, I mentioned before, was teaching at Northwestern. They are now the deans of life schools of life sciences at Tsinghua and Beida. They're world-class guys. Um, and they, but they wrote an article in Science Magazine complaining about grants and awards still depending too heavily on who you know, not what you know. That even for someone like Shuri, Rowie was supposed to make it to the, uh, be an academician of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, <laughs> got turned down by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, right? That was a scandal. Uh, Shuri Gong, who is very patriotic, uh, who thinks America is a racist society. I interviewed him. Says he left America because he thought it was a racist society. He's, he's been scathing in his comments, public comments, about that, you know, I should be getting more grants and more of the money, and it's just not coming to our university. It's coming to people who know how to build guanxi, who know how to build relationships. 
Um, now, if you think about it, you know, a lot of people, those people who came back, well, let me say this one. The big issue when Stan and I were doing this, and Stan edited a lot of articles about this, the red eye disease, the original crisis or conflict was the local PhDs versus the overseas PhDs. Now the fight is the early returnees versus the late returnees. Because the early returnees are now the, the presidents of universities. They are the deans of top schools. And it's the, under them that these thousand talents people, if they don't get the deanship, they're going to come in underneath those people. And that relationship is very complex because it's like saying, well, you know, I went to Columbia. I, I, know, I can give you a case of a guy I know who's a president of a university in Dalian. And I met him. And, I, and, and he doesn't like this program. And why doesn't like his program? Well, partly, he was not going to say, he went to Columbia as a postdoc for two years in the 1980s. He's the president of a university, but he doesn't get the kind of benefits that these new guys are getting. And sort of like, you know, what am I, chopped liver? You know, uh, these guys are, why are these guys getting uh, um, uh, all the great uh, advantages and I'm not? So they're the big stars. I mean, it's like saying, you're a star. Bring back a star. Well, if you're a star, what am I? You know, and I've, so it's the same kind of problems that we've had before. Uh, let's see, I don't know what word. Right, but now they've, what they've done is partly under this pressure, oh, here's some critiques. Now you can use websites to go and, and do critiques. So here's one guy who says, don't spend all this money on these senior people who are already past their prime. Uh, their creative burst is past. Uh, bring back 10,000 recent PhDs, and someone's going to come up with a Nobel Prize. You're much better off investing your money in something like that. Um, another really silly thing about the program is that they're contracts, and they're asking people overseas to give up tenure and come back without a tenured position. Uh, that's not going to work. And so the policy caved in very quickly, and the six full-time policy became, they were very willing to accept people for two months. So it went back to this part-time policy. You can come back for two months rather than being a policy that was targeted entirely on getting people to come back full-time. And a lot of people criticized that. Uh, personal Ministries Bureaus, and remember, there's still a long problem. Many overseas scholars have little confidence that they can adjust to the domestic environment. Um, third critique from my friends in the Ministry of Education, they feel that the organization department's now getting all the credit, but they're still doing the work. So here we have little bureaucratic politics at work. Um, and they're uncomfortable where they've been working their lives trying to bring people back from overseas. Now this has become politicized. It's a talent war. It's the parties out there doing this when they've been doing this stuff for a long time. Um, these are people I've known in the Ministry of Education for a long time, right? So here's an interview I did in 201 with a thousand talent scientist. And he said, recent returnees will always have more trouble getting grants. It takes at least three years for people to know and trust you. There are, right, there are two aspects in evaluation application. The project plan, which is 60, 70% of the evaluation is based on that, but 30 to 40% is based on relationships. You know, it's not that way at the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States. Here, people are expected to phone the people on the committee and lobby so that they can get the award or to get their friends to phone and do that kind of stuff. Relationships are still very important for a lot of this. Um, and so too much money goes directly to the directors and research institutes who, uh, rather than the scholars themselves who can allocate the money. So here's my hero, Lee and Chow. Um, I actually was invited, this is one of the great moments of my life, um, uh, in June of 19, uh, last year I was invited to Shenzhen I had 10 minutes in Chinese. I was one of six panelists. I had 10 minutes to tell him what was wrong with his program. Um, and my friends in the Ministry of Human Resources said to me, just tell him. You know, I said, well, you know, I'm not comfortable. Do you tell a Chinese Lee this is, this is his program, you know, his face, all of this, what do I do? And they just said, go for it. And so I had 10 minutes to do that. Uh, this is the party secretary of Shenzhen, who was also on the panel. Um, and my answer was, power of administrators is just too much. That if you're a, senior, you're a world-class scientist in the United States, why are you going to go back and put yourself working under somebody else who has some authority over you? And again, I mentioned the president of that university from Dalian. He didn't like this program. 
and he and Li Yuan Chao got here, uh, they got into an argument, uh, partly triggered by me, but they got into an argument. Um, the president of that university claimed, well, so, so what happened was here, I gave my presentation, I said, you know, academic uh, administrators have too much power, and Li Yuan Chao quickly turns to this president of Dalian, one of the Dalian universities, and says, Right? And he says, you know, the, this person says that you've got too much power, do you agree or disagree? And the guy, of course, starts to get defensive, right? Um, uh, and uh, he said, well, he doesn't really like the program because it's too inequitable. And Li Yuan Xiao answered to him, you know, well, bu shi wei le ping dang, ar shi wei le fa zhan, you know. I'm not doing this to bring about equality. I'm doing this to bring about growth, right? And, and it's interesting, when I did my interviews in Xi'an, the person, the woman I interviewed in Xi'an used the exact same language, which is the leftists versus people who are concerned about development. Um, and so I found that very interesting that that kind of attitude had come down. She was just a university official, right? Well, and anyway, so that was really interesting. And then he and I, this guy from, from the university, got into a big fight. So age distribution does fit. So let me just say, we got 500 people. I went, and this is how I actually told Li Yuan Chao that he was, what his program was like, because I collected data on 500 cases off the web. We got the 360 that the originally had been posted, and then I hired an RA who went on the web uh, and did his best to collect names. We wound up with 500 of the first 1,500. So that's not bad. We had one third. And I, when I told Li Yuan Chao, I have 500 of your people, you know, and he, they sort, he sort of looked at the people beside him and they all went, oh, Butsua, you know, that I had already, even though it wasn't supposed to be public, I had already collected 500 people. Um, uh, 500 names. And so this is what the data say from the 500, right? Um, so here you can see the age is actually pretty good. You're getting people who are in their creative age. Where was their last country of residence? Right, this is why I say country of PhD, last country of residence where they were working. So this group, largely, largely USA, which is the reason I think that, you know, the American American people need to be aware of the program. Year in which they received their PhD, so these people have been out and around for a long time. These are fitting the model of what they want, right? But the real data, the big problem is that full-time versus part-time, right? And A, innovative are scholars working in universities and research institutes. B, innovative, which is a much smaller category, are scholars or managers and scientists in enterprises, working in an enterprise, and these are people running their own companies, right? And it's very clear that the full-time people are the entrepreneurs. They're willing to come back full-time. And that the program, in fact, has only gotten 20, which is actually not bad when you think about it. 20% are actually full-time. Um, uh, are actually uh, academics, um, but the majority of academics are coming back part-time. And I, did, I couldn't show, I didn't hand him this table, but I, I gave him the numbers, uh, which very much convinced him. Uh, where have they settled? Uh, again, the big city, Beijing wins, right? This is my data, this is my data. Beijing wins, Shanghai, mm -hmm. and then distribution among some of the other places. Uh, year of return. Now this again, this shows you one of the problems with the program is in order to meet the quotas, governments have given the award to people who had already returned, which is silly, right? But they need to meet the quota, so they awarded. So you can see, you know, when did people come back? Well, some of these people came back, a lot of these people came back before the program even began, right? So here's your, I could darken in this right, because here's 2008. Now, it certainly has brought back people since 2009, so there's success, it's clearly, but again, it's mixed. Let me just say that the big problem, I think, for the program, one of the big problems is Li Yuan Chao did not make it to the Politburo Standing Committee, that's number one. He was the one, when I gave him my presentation, we thought he was gonna be number four or five, right? So I was like, I was in heaven. I was giving a presentation to a guy who was going to be a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Um, he didn't make it, and he's no longer the head of the organization department. Uh, there's a guy named Zhao Liju, Zhao Liji, who is the new head, and he, every year in 
December, there is a conference in Guangzhou called the Returnees, the Guangzhou uh, Liu Jiaohui, the Returnees Association meeting. And Li Yuanchao had appeared there, I think, two or three times in the last number of years. And he had talked about this program. He had started a program on foreign, foreign returnee, foreign thousand talents, young, young thousand talents. He'd, he had launched them at this meeting. So he was very much integrated with this returnee community. And I've seen him meet with returnees and sit and talk to them. Zhao Liji was in Guangzhou at the time of the, right around the time of the conference, and he didn't attend the conference. And so that's made us all a little disheartened that maybe this whole program, you know, as they say, the, you change the party secretary, you redo the water conservation project, right? That, that new leaders don't necessarily want to keep policies going that someone that are linked to somebody else's name. Um, so, I mean, some people would say that I, I met somebody a few days ago who said to me they thought it was the worst, their, their mainlander. Um, where did I meet them? I met them, I must have been in, in Hong Kong, and, but they were uh, someone still living in the mainland, a researcher, and he told me that he thought it was one of the worst programs he'd ever heard of. Um, but I don't think it's a, you know, I think it's a complex issue. It's got some good points, it's got some problem, some problematic points, but in any case, we'll see whether or not it goes forward, but clearly, at least in this period from about 2008 to 2010, 2011, we clearly saw, or even up until more recently, we've seen the party getting very active in this, and I think it just goes along part of the whole idea of what we've seen, which is a much more active, but in some ways much more open. You know, I mean, the fact that I gave a briefing to the head of the organization department, the fact that uh, it really has been much more open on this program, that even though you could say, ah, the party's coming into the state's territory or the government's territory, on the other hand, it's maybe it's good that the party's coming into the state's territory because it has to be more open um, and this will put pressure on it. So, thank you.